Amen. Okay, so we're in Matthew chapter 28 on this uh, Easter Sunday morning. Um, and I, we're just going to look down at that verse of the week again, uh, Matthew 28 and verse number 9. Matthew 28, 9, which says this, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. And the title of my sermon this morning is Responding to the Resurrection. Responding to the Resurrection. I'd like to pray before we get going with this message. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for, um, well, the fact that you sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to to die, um, not only to die, not only to be buried, but to, to rise from the dead, Lord. And um, I thank you for this um, th this truth that we're going to look at today and, and what it means to us, Lord. And um, help me to just preach this message clearly and, and accurately and boldly, Lord, and in a way that everyone will just really listen to, to what your word has to say, Lord, and, and uh, take it into their hearts, Lord. And in Jesus' name we pray all of this. Amen. Amen. Okay, so it's Easter, which means that we're thinking specifically, aren't we, about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? That's what Easter is about something that wasn't only witnessed by a load of people. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 6, that Turner says that he was seen of the 12, and I, I think perhaps probably uh, talking about Matthias uh, at this point. Then after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some have fallen asleep. But, but the resurrection was also prophesied about in various ways ways long before Jesus Christ came to die for our sins. Okay, so there's many prophecies of the resurrection in the Word of God. Uh, last year I preached on 12 of the clearest prophecies for me um, on the resurrection in Scripture on our Easter Sunday morning service, of which I included six from, from long before the event in the Old Testament. Okay, and, and um, I just found them interesting. Jo Jonah chapter 2, Isaiah 53, Psalm 40, Psalm 16, Psalm 2, Job 19, among many others. There are many more, especially when you include various pictures that you see in the Old Testament as well of, of the resurrection as well. And six six of them I, I preached which came straight out of the Lord Jesus Christ's mouth as well as he carried out his three-year ministry. So there's prophecy after prophecy after prophecy of the resurrection, some dating back thousands and thousands of years. And if you want to know about those, please look back at that sermon that's on our YouTube channel from a year ago um, if you're interested in those prophecies. But for anyone genuinely investigating, so genuinely investigating the Bible. Because some people claim to investigate something that really they already have a view, something that they're just trying to, um, they're, they're, they're trying to just support their already preconceived idea, okay? But if you're genuinely investigating the Bible, and particularly the resurrection, you would have to acknowledge two truths. Okay, so truth number one, that the much prophesied Christ was also much prophesied to rise from the dead. And then point number two, truth number two, is that many eyewitnesses attested to the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, so two truths. You've got one, that the Christ was going to rise from the dead. And number two, that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead. With Paul going as far as naming some of the many eyewitnesses in 1 Corinthians 15, and some of these men writing accounts of the resurrection in Scripture, but there being many others. And with most of these eyewitnesses then going on to choose serious persecution, Serious, not, not the sort of persecution that maybe we'll all complain about, serious persecution, rather than deny what they had seen. Okay? And if you acknowledge these two truths, then there is one obvious conclusion. What's the obvious conclusion? That Jesus of Nazareth was that, was that prophesied Christ. Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Now, now that's the thing about the resurrection. It's not just some cool miracle or some random bit of power shown for no reason. The resurrection is the final piece of validation for the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, it, it's the final piece, piece of proof, if you like, that he was, as Peter said in Matthew 16, 16, which reads, and Simon Peter answered said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Christ could only be the Son of God. In Romans 1, Paul starts his epistle to the Romans with this truth. Romans 1 starts with verse 1 saying, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. So he was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. I mean, that's some power, isn't it? 
That was the final, that was like the icing on the cake, if you, if you want. The, the resurrection is an essential part of the gospel. Not just because he's the first fruits with our resurrection to come, our physical bodily resurrection to come as well, but because the resurrection of Jesus was the final proof that he was the Christ, the son of the living God. Without the resurrection, he wouldn't have been fulfilling all the prophecies, would he? Without the resurrection, he would have been a liar. Without the resurrection, we would all be on our way to hell. Every single one of us, because we've all sinned to come short of the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 17, you have to turn there, says, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, you are yet in your sins. It's as simple as that. If Christ is not raised, well, you can write off half of this. It's all a waste of time. The whole lot is a waste of time. And of course, our faith is in the inspired, preserved words of God, okay? Just to make that clear. But one of the integral parts of this book is the resurrection. That's integral to the Bible, integral to Christianity, is the resurrection of Christ. And in fact, it's described as being there being many infallible proofs of the resurrection. The resurrection is an essential truth. And there are a few ways that people respond to that truth that we see in Matthew chapter 28 that I want to go through today. Because in Matthew 28, it's early in the morning, okay? And this angel, the messenger of God, says this to the two Marys. In verse 5, it says, And the angel answers, said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples. Word the title is responding to the resurrection. And point number one is respond by trusting him. Respond by trusting him. Verse six said, he is not here for he is risen as he said. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. The angel, the messenger of God here, reminded the Marys of the words of Christ, of the many times that he prophesied of his resurrection that I mentioned. As recently as a day or two before his death, he said this to his disciples in Mark 10, 34, after saying about being condemned to death and delivered to the Gentiles, he said in verse 34, and they shall mock him and shall scourge him and shall spit upon him and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. He said it clearly to his disciples. The angel of God also told them how to see him. It says in verse 7, And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. Now, this was something else that Jesus himself had said this, this time on the final night. Okay, he said this in Matthew 26 and verse 32. If you want to flick back to chapter 26 and verse 32. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. So the Marys trusted what Jesus had said as relayed by the messenger of God. Okay. And of course, they were already saved. But isn't, isn't that also what is required for salvation? Trusting the words of the Lord Jesus Christ as relayed by his messenger as relayed by a messenger of God. And in our case, in, in, in the case of people in this world, it's not by a, 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 an angel, it's not by a supernatural being. The messenger of God is a soul winner with the King James Bible preaching the word of God. Amen. Trusting the words of the Lord Jesus Christ as relayed by his messenger. And, and if you're unsaved, okay, and I don't know if there's anyone here that maybe is unsaved, and I'm not trying to scan to look at particular people, and I've just got to be careful when I preach. So sometimes I just preach, I just glance at someone. I think, oh, no, no, it looks like I'm like trying to say it. There we go. I'm, I'm just saying, look, maybe there are people in a room this size, there's going to be people unsaved in here, sadly. If you're unsaved, if you haven't trusted Jesus Christ as your saviour, respond to the resurrection by trusting him. Respond to the resurrection by trusting him. Turn to John chapter 11. Trust that death, that burial, that resurrection as payment for your sins. Trust him. Trust the words of Christ who said in John chapter 11, John chapter 11, when speaking to Martha in verse 25, John 11, 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever, that's anyone, liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Do you believe him? Do you trust him or are you trusting yourself? 
Are you still trusting your works in one of the many ways that people trust their works? The many, many ways. People trust their works in obvious ways, in blatant ways, like all the false religions of the world, the open ones, the five pillars of, of the monstrosity of Islam, the, the seven sacraments of the monstrosity of Roman Catholicism, one of the many just obvious, you have to work your way to heaven. Are you trusting your works? Or are you trusting your works in the more subtle ones? With the, well, you've got to at least turn from your wickedness. You've got to at least give your life to Christ. You've got to turn from your evil way. And, and I, I had a guy, so I, I, I'm just going to go off on a quick tangent here. It's not really a tangent because it's in, in line with what we're talking about here. I had a guy contact me the other day. Um, What's his name? Stephen Calder, I think his name was. That Clayden. Stephen Clayden. Uh, this, this guy uh, emailed me, said, um, uh, it's about evangelism in South. Can I, said, could Ian Taverner call me? So um, I replied, you know, he's left his number. I said, what's it concerning, please? And the, the email was evangelism in Southend. So I replied, what's it concerning, please? He said, we're doing an evangelism event. We're aware that Strong Tower uh, evangelizes in Southend. If, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and we would like to invite you to partake in our evangelism event, you and your church members. So this will be interesting. <laughs> so so uh, I went, I tried to look in and I, I, I spoke to a brother who, uh, who had a bit of time, said he'd have a look as well. Um, and I looked into to, to this guy and, um, and I found a video of him standing on a soapbox type thing with a loudspeaker very early in the morning in Clacton on Sea with a couple of crackheads and drug addicts walking, <laughs> different types of drug addicts walking around, no one else pretty much shouting about apparently preaching the gospel. And there's a guy in the background just going, wow, amen, hallelujah, hallelujah, while he's preaching. And, and it sounded at the beginning, it's like, it's not of your works. It's grace through faith. But he's quoting dodgy Bible versions. You're thinking, okay, well, let's wait for it. Let's wait for it. And I had to sit through 24 minutes of this. I think I was, I was at work or something. So at least I just had it in my headphones thinking, wait for it, wait for it. Sure enough. You need to turn from your wickedness and put your faith in Jesus Christ. You've got to turn from your evil way. It's, it's and only by faith in Christ. It's like these guys literally contradict themselves in the one sentence. It's faith alone in Christ by turning away from your wickedness. What on earth? Because turning away from your wickedness is hard. In fact, Jonah 3.10 clearly says that God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented the evil that he said he would do unto them, and he did it not. Turning from your evil ways works. And my Bible says, for by grace you say through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works. Lest any man should boast. Yeah. These guys just, they, they, and, and it's so funny. So, so, I looked, so I just looked at this video, and he had all this other stuff, and if you want to, and, and it was, he's all about Zion, because they're always just so off on everything else. Zionism, beyond, like Zionism on steroids. I mean, stars of Rem fan behind him while he preaches. You know, all this sort of wickedness. The Jews are amazing. The Jews this. I love the Jews. Shalom, shalom, Yeshua. Yeah, you know, all that stuff. You know, all that. I'm going to pretend I know Hebrew when I don't. You know, and, and when you go back to the Hebrew, all that stuff. Because they just, when you're off on salvation, you just go off on everything, don't you? Yeah, all over the place and everything. And, and, and obviously, I didn't sit through that stuff. But, but anyway, so I just replied and said, um, thanks for the invite. However, uh, we don't agree with your message, you know, etc. You, you, uh, you preach your work salvation. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, and left it there. The reply was, uh, he said, no, he said, <laughs> I said, having looked at your online content, uh, can you tell me what you looked at? So I just, I just said, this one has it, or, uh, this one is full of it. And then that was the last message I sent and sent him a screenshot of this, uh, of this video. I don't know how you took that message as being work salvation. We completely agree with what you believe, that it's grace through faith, and it's like, they, they, it's, they, they just, it's complete denial. They're, they're, they're completely mad because they're, they're so given over, these false prophets. They can't understand that telling someone they've got to, I even quoted, turn from your wickedness, turn from your evil way. That's not the gospel. That's not what Jesus Christ died for. He didn't die and go to hell and rise from the dead for you to earn your way to heaven. Otherwise, why did he die on the cross? He died to pay for your sins, not for you to add a bit to it. And... and, and these people are everywhere, and they're so subtle. 
because they, they say this, like, oh, no, Grace, in fact, they quote Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, they quote John 3, 16, they quote all the, all the verses, it's belief, 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 and then they go, oh, but you've got to just turn away, you've got to at least give up this, no this or that, no drunkard, no, with their loud hailer, some poor old ladies walking by, go, what's this guy on about, you know, he's like, no drunkard, shall inherit the kingdom, God, and people go, wow, he's so brave. So brave's preaching the same message that everyone else does in the world. Your works will get you to heaven. But it's not by works. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Where was I? Okay, yeah, so emails. Annoying. But if you haven't trusted Christ, okay, you need to put your trust in Christ. And, and you need to respond to the resurrection by trusting him. Okay, how do you trust him? You put your faith at his death, burial, resurrection paid for not just your past sins, not just your present sins, but also your future sins. Because my Bible says when someone asked, when that Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and the house. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you trust the Lord Jesus Christ. You put your faith in that death, that burial and that resurrection to have paid for all your past, present, future sins. Go back to Matthew 28 and verse 8, which said, And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, All hail! And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. The title is responding to the resurrection. Number one, respond by trusting him. Number two, respond by worshipping him. Respond by worshipping him. Two separate things. They're two separate things, just to make that clear. Just because you're trusting Christ doesn't mean you're going to go on to worship Christ. Just because you're worshipping Christ doesn't mean that you're trusting Christ. But if you're trusting Christ, you can respond to the resurrection by worshipping Christ. And I hope most people in here are trusting for salvation, but are you bowing at his feet and reverently worshipping him too? Are you doing that as well? You might be trusting him, you might be appreciating salvation, but are you worshipping him as, as well? And by the way, only God receives worship, right? Should receive worship. Jesus Christ had no problem being worshipped because he is God. He's the son of God. He's God in the flesh. They didn't lift up his legs, by the way, so, he didn't, so they didn't have to put too much effort in. I don't see any indication of that. They didn't kind of grab his leg and lift it up and go, I don't want to have to get on my knees. It's a bit dirty down there, a bit sandy. Probably a bit sandy, wasn't it, or something? They didn't do that, I don't think. They didn't ask him to pop around the house so they could be a bit more comfortable when they did worship him. If you could come to us, Jesus, uh, yeah, I, I know you're here right now. If you could just carry on walking for another mile or two, come around to where we're staying, then we could worship you in, a, in a, you know, where we have our creature comforts. You could work in, in, our, in our way, you know, according to how we want to worship you. They dropped to their knees, they held his feet, and they worshipped him. They, dropped, they saw Jesus Christ, they dropped to their knees, held on to his feet and worshipped him. And doesn't he deserve that? Doesn't the Lord Jesus Christ deserve worship? He died for you. He descended into hell for you. He paid every single bit of your sin debt for free. He did the whole lot for you. Yet how many believers refuse to worship him? So many will only worship him on their terms, as long as it doesn't require too much of their effort. As long as they don't have to put in too much effort, they'll do a little bit of worship, but he said to worship him. You say, when you say to worship, we'll turn to Psalm 95. He commands worship. The, the risen saviour of the world commands reverent worship. And when was the last time that you got on your knees and worshiped God? Who this morning, you don't have to raise your hands. <laughs> But this is just a rhetorical question out there. I wonder who this morning dropped on their knees this morning before coming to church at some point and worshipped God. Yet Psalm 95 and verse 3 says, For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Talking about false gods, talking about whatever people set up and make as gods. No, he's above them all. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship 
and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord our maker. That's the psalmist telling us to get down and kneel before the Lord our maker. Getting on your knees when you pray to God, okay? You know what? It, it, it puts you in the correct reverent frame of mind. If you don't do that, if it's something that you don't do, okay, and it's not something maybe only when things are really bad, or maybe you just don't do it for whatever reason, can I encourage you to do it? Please, can I encourage you to get on your knees and worship God? Not right now. Hey, don't everyone jump up. We haven't got any of those kneeling cushions they got in the <laughs> Anglican church. I'm kidding, okay? Okay, they need them in there. They got their dodgy hard floors, all right? No, I, I'm joking. You don't have to do that now, but you know what? Why not when you get up in the morning, get on your knees and worship God? You know, when you get on your knees and you pray to God and you bow your head and you pray to God, it, it, it makes, it encourages you to be more humble than maybe the flesh wants to be. It encourages you to put him in the right position rather than you're sort of, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, can you give me this? Can you give me that? It encourages you to pray, not just a genie in a lamp type prayer. It encourages you to, when you get down on your knees and you bow your head, to apologise, to come to him to confess and forsake your sins. It encourages you to pray for other people. It encourages you to, to, to beg for the things that you want from God and not to treat him like you just click your fingers, he gives you what you want. Bowing, on, bowing your knees to God, for me, is a must in the Christian life. And it's something that if you don't do or sometimes you fall out of doing it a bit, maybe a bit rushed and everything else, you quickly appreciate why you should be doing it when you start doing it again. But it's not just about prayer time. Turn, did, did I tell you to turn to John chapter 4? Turn to John 4 if you haven't. God wants us to worship him properly. Okay, He's looking for people to worship him properly. That's what he wants. He doesn't just want you to, okay, well, I'd say a few prayers. Okay, yeah, I've got, got, in, a, got in a kneeling position now, okay. He convicted me of that. Now, he wants you to worship him in all ways properly. John chapter 4 says in verse 23, John 4, 23 says, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Where do we worship him in truth? Well, you don't have to turn to 1 Timothy 3.15 says about the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Go back to Matthew 28. There isn't any truth at repent of your sins, Baptist. There's no truth there. It's done. It's not, it's not a house of God. There's no truth at Bible of the Month Community Church where they're chopping and changing and they, they use a bit of this Bible, a bit of that, whatever suits them so they can be the final authority. That's not the truth. That's not the word of God. They're not the house of God. You're turning back to Matthew 28, Psalm 5, 7 says, But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy and in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. It's in the house of God. That's where he wants us worshipping him. As a collective together, lifting up our voices, uh, in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, praying to the Lord, honouring his word, preaching his word, reading his word. That's how God wants us to worship him, in spirit and in truth. Not on YouTube. And again, I know, look, I know we have people watching and, and they, some people can't get here for whatever reason. Some people have problems in life when they can't get to the house of God. But for many, for many out there, it's not because they can't get here, it's because they choose not to worship him. Sometimes you just got to put some effort in for the truth. And back in Matthew 28, Jesus demanded some effort. He said in verse 10, Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid, go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. There shall they see me. Do you know how far Galilee was? It's about 100 miles. It was 100 miles from where they were. They've come and worshipped him, and he said, You tell my brethren to get themselves into Galilee. A hundred miles, a hundred miles at approximately a walking pace of four miles an hour is about 25 hours. That's a lot of walking. That's a big travel. That's a big distance to go and see the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? Oh, well, you know, I don't have to go anywhere because church is at home. Well, he told them to go to Galilee. And you know what? God wants us to put some effort in to go and worship him in spirit and in truth. Sometimes you've got to travel to worship the Lord. That's just the way it is. 
Sometimes there are people that will up, that will change their whole lives, that will shift things, that will move, that will, that will relocate, that will do long journeys. And we have many of those types of people in our church. And do you know what it is? It's an even more damning uh, indictment, sadly, on those in this town and, in this, and all around, really, the London area who are that close to, to, the, to, a, to a genuine house of God. And look, maybe there are others up around that we just don't know of in other places, but, and they just refuse to worship him. They've got someone which has the gospel, has the word of God, has a King James Bible, and, and, and does some sort of preaching of the gospel out and about, and, and they can, can at least you can do that from that church. That's the house of God. Why aren't they worshiping him? Why aren't they going and doing that? And sometimes you've got to put the effort in. He said in verse 10, that Jesus said unto them, Be not afraid, go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Let's keep going. Verse 11 says, Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. The title is responding to the resurrection. Number one, respond by trusting him. Number two, respond by worshipping him. Number three, don't respond by hating him. Don't respond by hating him. Imagine that, okay, they showed the truth. It says all the things that were done. Some of the watch came into the city and showed them to the chief priests, this is verse 11, all the things that were done. They could have got right with God, couldn't they? Put their trust in the Saviour. No, instead they use their money to hide the truth. They're using their wealth, their money, to hide the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And 2 Timothy 3.8 says of these types of religious psychopaths, now as Jannies and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. These are wicked people. This is the type of people being described here. Wicked God-haters. They know the truth and they're promoting a lie. They know the truth, they're promoting a lie. And that is every false prophet out there today. Every false prophet, in their various ways, they know the truth, they're promoting a lie. That's your vicars, your priests, your imams, your rabbis, your, your monks, your Pentecostal pastors, your, you name it, you repent of your sins, so-called Baptist pastors, whatever, whoever. Anyone that's, that's not preaching the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ if they're teaching a lie, if they're teaching, they're preaching, they're a false prophet. And that's the sort of people that we're seeing here. They're covering up, they're changing the truth of God into a lie. They want to hide the truth. They want to promote lies. They want to falsely accuse his disciples. And how often will we get falsely accused in various ways? Falsely accused of teaching something that maybe we don't. Falsely accused of this, falsely accused of that, because that's what they do. It's the ad hominem attack. It's the attack the messenger. It's to claim the disciples are liars, are this, are that, are bad people. They're, you know, they're a cult. They're this, they're that, whatever they can to try and stop people there, then listening to the message and putting their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to 2 Peter 2. Do you know, though, what all these people were before they were false prophets? Do you know what these, these Jews here, these leaders here, these elders, these chief priests were? Do you know what the vicar was before he was a false prophet? What the priest was? What the imam? What the rabbi? What the Pentecostal pastor? What, whatever these guys are. Do you know what they were before they were sometimes open, obvious false prophets? I mean, some of them are just wearing a dress and a magic hat, and it's like, it's just ridiculous. But some are more subtle. Some try and look like us, dress like us, carry a Bible like us, pretend they're studying the Bible, pretend they're, they're doing exegesis of the Bible, and they care so much about what the Word of God says. Do you know what they all were? They were unsaved people before that. They were unsaved people who rejected the truth and eventually were given over to a reprobate mind. That's what they were. They had the chance to get saved and they rejected it and hated the way of truth. That's what happened. And look at 2 Peter 2, talking about these types of people. It says, for if after they have, uh, verse 20, sorry, 2 Peter 2, 20, 
For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, so the knowledge, it doesn't say that they've put their trust in him, they are again entangled therein and overcome. So they've had the, the, the ability, they've had something that means they could have, they could have accepted the truth in one way or another. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it, they know the way, that there's some amount of truth that's been made known unto them, even just a knowledge of the Creator, to turn from the holy commandment given unto them. They've turned away from it. They didn't seek. They didn't, they didn't therefore then go, okay, I've got an idea. I'm going to go this way. They've turned the other way. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and a sow that was washed to a wallowing in the mire. And my point is this, is if you're still privately rejecting the gospel, and there will, there'll be people in a church like this that are privately rejecting the gospel, denying the truth. Let me tell you how you should respond to the resurrection. Don't respond by hating him. This is a risk for, for every unsaved person out there. It could get to the point where it's too late. If it's too late, you're done. You're twice dead. If you're rejecting the truth, you, had it, ha, you, you have that and you, you reject the truth and you're turning and basically going to that lie, you can get to the point where it's too late for you. It said in verse 11 in Matthew 28, Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and take accounts, so they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. The title is responding to the resurrection. Number one, respond by trusting him. Number two, respond by worshipping him. Number three, don't respond by hating him. And number four, don't respond by denying him. Don't respond by denying him. The watch showed all things that were done. Maybe some of them believed on him. Maybe not. I don't know. We don't really know. But when they were offered large money to deny the truth, what happened? Look at verse 15. So they took the money and did as they were taught. They sold Jesus out for cash. That's what they did. They chose to deny Christ so they would be richer. They denied the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, they denied the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ for money, to get richer, to be more wealthy. And isn't that a choice of so many today? And this applies to both unbelievers and believers. Unbelievers who chase money, make mammon, or, or the God of money their God, yeah? And reject anything to do with the true God. So many are like that, aren't they? Turn to John chapter three. They deny the truth of the word. They even deny just basic common truths of life, like the fact of there being a creator. People will go that far because instead they want to chase money. And it's a convenient excuse. I mean, that's got to be one of the worst ones. I mean, it's one thing to everyone, like it seems, all of us here probably at some point believed in some form, or even as a young child, some form of work salvation. But to just deny the fact of a creator is so bizarre, it's so moronic, and, and, and so many do it, it seems. And it seems to be growing because it's a convenient excuse we can tell yourself how clever you are. You're just clever now. I had a guy in, in, um, uh, when we did the Soul Winning Marathon last week, and he started by saying he's raised a Catholic, and, and then suddenly when I started trying to explain to him the gospel, he suddenly decided he now no longer believes in God because he's, he's, much, he's, he's learnt so much now about science. He said he's a scientist. No, in fact, he said, he said, I'm a scientist. I said, oh, wow. I said, okay, what, sort, what field of science are you in? Computer science. <laughs> Wasn't it true, Brother Clifford, yeah? <laughs> Computer science was his field of science. He's, he solved it. Is it. We were talking about this. Is it just computer science what they called it at school? Or is there, such, is there even such thing? I thought that's just what they called, like, playing games on the computer. And it, that, that, <laughs> the one that you went to go, wow, well, at least it's computer science today. <laughs> this will be easy. We just sit there and play some games and stuff, you know? That, I think that, I don't know. So, so I was like, oh, wow, computer science, okay? <laughs> so... <laughs> 
So I said, so I gave him this analogy, which many of you are here that, you know, similar sort of thing. I just said, okay, so you just had like the most powerful, most amazing, most intelligent computer in the whole world. And I had it here in front of you. I said, look at this. And you being a computer scientist, <laughs> you'd really appreciate this, right? And I said, and you said to me, where did you get that from? And I just went, it made itself. You'd call me a complete moron, wouldn't you? You'd call me an imbecile. And I said, oh, but, but, but. There's a missing ingredient. It happened over billions of years. <laughs> You'd still call me an idiot. And I don't know what he said to that. He kind of wanted to have a debate with that. Anyway, come on, let's go. You don't want to hear it. But point being, that people will come up with the most bizarre outlandish ideas. And really, a lot of the time, it's because they just want to reject God and chase whatever small God, uh, small G God it is of their own hearts, their own minds. And a lot of the time, it's money, isn't it? They're chasing money and denying the Lord for money to be wealthier. Uh, John 3, you're in, aren't you? Uh, I think deep down the conscience is pricked by the covetousness. I think this is part of it. The idolatry. The, the, because it, it should, look, we're given an innate conscience, right? So unless you're given over and your conscience is seared, you're going to be pricked by that. You're going to be pricked by that covetousness. So, so you kind of got two choices. You either... Start going, okay, yeah, you know, this is wrong and accepting that you're, that, you're, that you're sinful in that way. Or you just deny the Lord and you hide from him and, and you, keep, you can be even more covetous and just pretend he doesn't exist. And John 3 says this in verse 19, this is condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone, excuse me, that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Choosing money and denying the Lord Jesus Christ is hiding from the light, isn't it? They, they, they deny the Lord, they deny the truth, they deny the resurrection, they deny all these things. They deny even the fact there is a God. They, I mean, they go into cloud cuckoo land type stuff and just go, it all came from nothing. Therefore, I can justify my sin even more. Therefore, I could try and get even richer and just money, 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 and just completely, for, completely not even think about God. We'll turn to Matthew 6, though, because this is also something that believers do the world over. So it's not just the unbelievers. You'll turn to Matthew 6. There are believers that choose careers. They choose cars. They choose houses. They choose lavish lifestyles over serving God in their nearest New Testament church. All over the place. They choose, it's whatever, well, I can't go to church on a Sunday because I've got to go to work. Do you really, though? Do you have to, is that your, do you have to choose that job? Could you not maybe choose a new career? Could you not choose a new job? Could you not do something different? Because it's an excuse, really, isn't it? Or at least you're saying, no, I like this number and I like the money I get from that, so I'm not serving God. They choose many, many ways they choose the money instead of serving God. Or some will just be so covetous, they can't even bear going into the house of God because they know that they're going to be reproved. They know that eventually it's going to get preached on, so they hide from the preacher, they hide from the word. They don't even want to read their Bible because their sin is going to be pointed out to them. They choose money over God. They choose bare minimum Christianity rather than telling others about the resurrection because it might dent their wallets. Because maybe that's not going to work so well in this job. It's not going to work there. It's not going to work here. Matthew 6.24 says it eventually becomes one or the other. It says in Matthew 6.24, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon being the God of money. You can't serve both. It won't, ha it won't work in the long run. Eventually, you'll end up choosing money usually. That's the truth, isn't it? Don't respond to the resurrection by denying him. And that's what we see with the, with the watch here. They end up denying the Lord Jesus Christ for money. Verse 15, back in Matthew 28, said, So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly recorded among the Jews to this day. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. 
Amen. The total is responding to the resurrection. Number one, respond by trusting him. Number two, respond by worshipping him. Number three, don't respond by hating him. Number four, don't respond by denying him. And number five, respond by sharing him. Respond by sharing him. Verse 17 shows that they didn't all have the same unwavering faith. He said, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted, some had doubts, some weren't as strong in their faith as others. Did Jesus tell those guys to go home and do a bit less? He didn't, did he? To leave the important work for the top guys. Leave the important work for the guys with the strongest faith. The rest of you, don't worry. No, he spake unto them, it said. And Jesus came and spake unto them in verse 18. He said, go ye which is a plural form of you in verse 19. He's talking to all of them. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. He said to go and teach all nations. That's all people. And what's the first thing to teach them? What's the first thing to teach all nations? Well, surely it's the will of God. What's the will of God? John 6, 40 says, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's the first thing to teach, isn't it? The gospel. I remember a pastor that I was at. I was at a church a while back who uh, I, I was, you know, green and just really zealous. And I was at this church going, away. they got the King James Bible. They seem to go out and do some sort of outreach, soul winning, whatever they call it. You know, they seem to believe the gospel. I was like, yeah, the Great Commission. I was like, we've got to preach the gospel. Don't, you know, I'm looking forward to preaching the gospel. And he was like, it's only half of the Great Commission. It's only half of the Great Commission. So... You've got to, it's, it's, it's teaching them, it's teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. It's discipling as well. What's he really trying to say? Shall I tell you what he's really trying to say? I don't like soul winning. That's what he's really trying to say. He's trying to put a down. Aside. How can you teach someone the rest of the Bible if they ain't saved? You've got to go and get them saved in the first place. All it is, it's another one of these guys who's like, no, 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 no. It's all about the discipleship because they don't really believe the gospel saves. That's the reality. They don't. They don't believe that you can go out and get someone saved and they won't be going to hell. They believe they have to be in church. And they don't want to then go out soul winning because, well, what happens if they don't come to church? They're still saved. They're still not going to hell. You need to get them saved to be able to teach you the rest of the Bible. Because they don't understand it otherwise. Because the natural man receiveth not the things, does he? It, it, they're foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. They have, they have to be saved to be able to understand the word of God. And without being saved, you ain't teaching them nothing worthwhile. It's, it's pointless. They don't even get it. You try and teach, and, and you've got to remember this, when you're out preaching the gospel and stuff, don't start trying to get in debates and teach people truths of the Bible. They don't want to hear the gospel. They don't want to hear the gospel. It's a waste of your time, complete waste of your time. They need, to, they need to understand the gospel to then start understanding other things. Sometimes it can be hard for them then as well because it's not just straight away, all right, now they're saved. I could teach them all sorts of, you know, in-depth things in the word of God. No, but you know what? Without salvation, they ain't going to get it. They won't get it. And they also flip-flop, chop and change, believe this for a bit, believe that for a bit, change for this for a bit, change for that for a bit. But it's about the gospel. And, and that's why nearly all four Gospels climax with the resurrection followed by the Great Commission with John, uh, with the Gospel of John just having an extra chapter at the end. We've just read Matthew 28, which said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you all the way even until the end of the world. Amen. And by the way, what's one of those things? For them to go out and preach the gospel as well. How can you teach someone to, to observe all things if you're not even going out and preaching the gospel? We, most teaching comes from example, doesn't it? But turn to Luke 24. Well, I read Mark 16, 15, which says, And he said unto them, again, the last chapter of Mark, halfway through the last chapter of Mark, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke 24 and from verse 46. Again, the last chapter of Luke. And he said unto, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ, or behooved Christ, sorry, to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. For any that have been conned by the repent of your sins lie, repentance is a change of mind for what they did believe. 
It's that repentance that brings you to faith in the Lord. It's changing your mind to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And remission of sins, that's the cancelling out of sins. How's that done? By the Lord Jesus Christ, death, burial and resurrection. And John 20 is the second to last chapter of John with the Sea of Tiberias. In chapter 21, it says in John 20, 21, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. How does that work? By preaching the gospel. By preaching the gospel. Because without people getting saved, there is no teaching them to observe all things. And with that in mind, where he said in Matthew 28, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lie with you all way, even until the end of the world. Amen. How do we respond to the resurrection? We respond by sharing the good news. We respond by going out and showing people what this means for them, by showing them that what the resurrection really means, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for their sins that all you have to do is put your faith, your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved. Okay, and, and repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. It's the same thing. You stop trusting what you did trust, you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That happens the day you trust Christ alone for salvation. You really trust him. You don't add him on. And go, oh, well, I think I was already going to heaven, but now I'm going to call the name of the Lord as well. No. You turn for what you did believe, you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's true salvation. And by the way, there's a three, third side of that coin. That's calling the name of the Lord. They're all the same thing. You repent, you believe, you call the name of the Lord. They're all the same thing. It's putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and stop trusting what you did before. But we respond by sharing it. We respond by showing people what it means for them. Okay? And how can we not? Really, think about it like that. How can we not share the gospel? How can we keep our mouth shut? How can you know the gospel? How can you know that your neighbor, your friends, your, your, your family members, the people you come across, your colleagues, the people that walk past here, the people that live in this area, around this church, pretty much the vast, vast majority of them are on their way to hell. They're going to die and go to hell because they're sinners and the wages of sin is death. Because death passed upon all men for the all have sinned. Everyone's a sinner. The punishment for sin is death. It's eternal death in hell. How can we not preach the good news? Because it doesn't matter what religion they're in. It doesn't matter what they're doing. It doesn't matter how sweet and nice they might be. It doesn't matter any of that. They're sinners on their way to hell. How, do, how can we not? We have the good, what, because we might sound a bit silly. Because, and you know what, you don't, it's not, these idiots standing in, because I've just been thinking about this guy, these idiots standing in town centres, just shouting some garbled message. Even if you preach the gospel. Say, say I stood, yeah, in a town centre and just preached the gospel to, you know, all the way through and I made it a bit of a longer gospel presentation. I went like 20, 20 minutes plus. Most of those people only hear part of it. Most of those people are going to miss the beginning. The people that hear the end are going to probably miss the beginning when I pointed out that they're a sinner, <laughs> when I point out that all sin takes them to hell. The people at the end will have missed that bit. The people at the beginning might miss the lot. It's just complete nonsense. All of that's a load of nonsense. But all we really need to do is just ask someone if they want to hear the gospel. That's all we're called to do. What he should be doing is just with his loud hailer going, would anyone like to know how to get saved? Would anyone... <laughs> Come over here, we'll actually show you properly. That's really about as far as the street preaching for me should go. Because yeah. it's just a waste of time. It's people trying to get aroused and trying to look tough and shout at queers that they need to repent. <laughs> Honestly, I had one of those as well. <laughs> but apparently they believe the same as us. Oh, they believe the same as us. You're yeah, all right, mate. He's got videos like mocking, like trying to knock Pastor Anderson and stuff. But apparently they believe the same as us. They just, he just, you know what they want? They want access to the sheep. They always want access to the sheep to sow some seeds, to turn some heads. Oh, we'll all do a group thing together. Great. Yeah. But anyway, back to this. How can we keep our mouth shut? So Corinthians 5.27 says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. 
You're saved, you're an ambassador for Christ. So God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. We're, we're praying, we're, we're pleading with people, we're imploring them to get saved. Be reconciled through Jesus Christ. Just put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet, how many refuse to even attempt to get someone saved? How sad is that? Now, it's not to shame people. Do you know what's the point in messages like this? Just to encourage anyone listening to this, whether you're online, whether you're sitting here, whether you, if, you, if, you're, if you're not saved, get saved. And if you're saved, you have one, the mo- one job, and it's the most important job in the world that God's given you, and that's to get other people saved. And whether that's by being part of a pair and just being silent and just being a support to someone else doing it, going out and preaching the gospel, or whether it's to learn and hopefully with that, They'll, in time you'd learn to be able to do the same is there anything more important in the world than to preach the gospel and get other people saved how can we celebrate the resurrection and not tell others about so great salvation but do you know what there are around this world right now around the south end right now there are churches everywhere celebrating Easter and they don't even tell anyone about it not just today not just in the week, not just next week, they'll go year after year after year without actually going out and telling anyone the good news about what that resurrection means. What on earth is that about? And they call themselves a church. But we respond by sharing him with all nations. That means going out to all people and preaching the gospel. The title is responding to the resurrection. Number one, respond by trusting him. Number two, respond by worshiping him. Number three, don't respond by hating him. Number four, don't respond by denying him. Number five, respond by sharing him. And, um, and, and that's hopefully, you know, something to think about as we think about, you know, as we, as we dwell today, especially on it being Easter Sunday, on it being the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, what that means for other people and how can we respond to that and make make use of that truth and not just, yeah, great, okay, Easter Sunday, let's eat some Easter eggs and get back to the daily grind tomorrow. But we're going to hopefully do that starting this afternoon. On that, let's finish in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for, um, well, the, the you know, just the truths that, that we, we know here and, and we know by faith, Lord, that we don't need all the evidence, all the, you know, all the, the infallible proofs, but they are, you know, they're, they're, they're obviously a faith strengthener sometimes as well. Uh, those prophecies that I preached about last year all being fulfilled, the, the many eyewitness accounts, um, of seeing the, the risen Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, over that 40-day period. And um, we, we thank you for, for all of that. We know that our faith isn't just upon the ramblings of some madman somewhere. Our faith doesn't rest upon um, ju- just what people have told us. Our faith rests upon the, the, the truth of your word and, and with that, the truth of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, proving that he is the Son of God, uh, the Saviour of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we, um, we pray that you just help us to make that truth um, clear to people this afternoon as we go out. So I want to bless our food together, bless our fellowship time, Lord. Um, um, bless our time just, just celebrating that resurrection and um, help us to, to just show other people about that, not just today, but as we go forward into our week and beyond. In Jesus' name, for all of this. Amen.